Hello, welcome and thank you for joining this webinar, Creating an Engaged Workplace with Atlassian, Zip, and Intuit. I'm beyond excited to be speaking with these three today. And you might be wondering what the common thread are between our speakers. Jen, Dom, and Scott are all global change makers who are rapidly innovating and fearlessly defining the future of work. They impact, the impact that they have is felt within their organizations day by day, supporting and empowering and improving the lives of their employees. Their impact is also felt on a much larger scale as they are driving forces in how their companies are building software, approaching challenges, and going to market with their products and services. Without further ado, let me introduce the speakers. First up, we have Jen, Director of People and Culture at Zipco. She's a radically candid people rebel on a mission to disrupt the HR space. Jen has, developed, has been developing high performing teams and leaders at unicorn companies like Zipco, Safety Culture, and Data Republic. Zipco has been exploding right now in the startup scene. It's just been a few weeks ago that Zipco acquired QuadPay, a New York-based leading buy now, pay later player, and is expanding its footprint into the US while boosting its customers to 3.5 million. For all of you online shoppers out there, Zip has created a delightful payment experience that gives users the freedom and flexibility to own how you pay, disrupting the traditional credit card market and model. They have roughly 500 employees globally, with 350 of them based in Australia. Something you might not know about Jen is, she's a massive Melbourne Demons fan and has grown up in Melbourne. She enjoys geeking out on business books and was into puzzling before it was even cool during COVID. She's worked at 20 plus companies in her time, uh, consulting at Deloitte and more recently in the tech space in Sydney. Welcome, Jen. <laughs> Next up, we have Dom. Dom is a fu work futurist at Alassian, a 62 billion homegrown tech success. Uh, having worked at Alassian for over seven years, Dom has seen the company evolve from a private listed 500 person startup to an established NASDAQ listed 5,000 employee tech innovator and disruptor, and they've only just started. A couple things you might not know about Dom. Pre-COVID, he was spending about 50% of his time traveling the world, speaking and learning from with folks globally, and the other 50% of his time was focused on bringing those lessons in-house at Alassian. Dom's originally from the UK, but has been calling Australia home for the last 12 years. He's traveled to over 50 countries and his favorite song may or may not be Queen's Don't Stop Me Now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next up we have Scott. Scott is a global employee and customer experience strategist leader of, and leader of human-centric transformations and optimizations. <clears throat> He's currently the director of international CX management at Intuit. Intuit is not only a renowned employer of choice, but it's also a mission-driven global financial platform that are the proud makers of TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint. They help more than 5, 50 million people around the world and have over 12,000 employees globally, with about 175 residing in Australia. Scott is also from the, originally from the UK and has been in Australia for 13 years now. Luckily, his role at Intuit, he gets to go back and forth to the UK at least a couple times a year. He looks after about eight countries for Intuit customer success, plus 150 with digital only presence, which means before COVID, he was spending a lot of time in the air. When he's not traveling, he loves to spend time with his partner and two Cocker Spaniels. Last up, my name's Nadine. I'll be your host for today. Uh, I head up talent and people at Flare, and in my career, I've been fortunate enough to help build some incredible venture-backed startups experiencing rapid growth across Sydney and Vancouver, Canada. Flair was named one of LinkedIn's top startups last year, and we're hoping to build a supportive community and culture, people and culture, let me try that again, <laughs> a supportive <laughs> community of people and culture professionals that can learn with each other. So thank you for joining us today. In the next hour, we're going to be talking about a lot of things, um, but what, a couple of key aspects are talking about the strategies to create an uh, engaged workplace, the challenges of navigating a pandemic as, a people, as people leaders, and talk about what the future could hold. One housekeeping item before we get started, we'll be dedicating time at the end for questions, so please be sure to get them into the question panel. Um, let's get started. Jen, I would love to start with you. 
And maybe you can tell me a little bit more about your role and people culture priorities at Zip. Of course. Hello. Hi, panel. Hi, everyone that's dialed in. <laughs> um, lovely to meet you all virtually. Um, I'm Jen. I am Director of People and Development. I had to think there for a bit. Uh, Director of People and Development <laughs> at Zip. Um, what does that actually mean? Um, I kind of do a little bit of everything in the people space, mainly around solving crunchy people problems. So um, at Zip, we're now five locations around the world, just under 500 people. Um, recently acquired a company in the US, moving really quickly. Um, and that's kind of what we're all about, um, helping people have the freedom to actually own it. So really kind of high accountability culture, um, good fun, authentic leaders, just wanting to kind of change the game and do things a little bit differently. And um, my day-to-day -day role is just enabling people to actually do that. That's awesome. What have been some of your priorities over sort of the course of 2020 with COVID involved? <laughs> yeah, so I definitely would have responded to this differently um, pre-COVID. Um, certainly sa safety from like a site safety and, um, and just people knowing, giving them a little bit more certainty around what's going on, but that, some, that work isn't actually something that is adding to that complexity. Um, another big thing in addition um, is more around the global expansion of ZIP. So ZIP everywhere, um, US, UK, um, New Zealand, and now in Australia, that's been a really big priority for the company and how we kind of design to deliver on that. Scott, would love to give you the stage to tell us a little bit more about your role. Sure, thank you. So one of the English people speaking. Um, so my role <laughs> is to look after um, our international customer success team. So as you kindly said, and thank you for the intro, um, I look after eight countries globally. So that's sort of all of our big markets outside of North America. And then we have over 150 digital um, present companies only, um, countries only, sorry. So we have a real focus around not only delivering our customer service um, proposition, but the, the key part of where I play a role with the teams is really understanding and partnering with our product teams. So we're accountable for voice of customer. So within our business unit alone, we talk to over 10 billion customers a year, which there's a hell of a lot of insight in there. So the team and I really focus on how do we feed that back to make sure that we're developing our products to be better for the customers, but also the employee experience. And we hold really firm on that around eliminating customer pain, but also how we're digitizing the experiences for our customers in the big, in the busy world that we're at. And exactly to Jen's point, if you'd have asked me um, this probably six months ago, I'm not sure I would have said busy digital world, um, but we've always had a focus, but it's very heightened at the minute. Yeah, exactly. And from an insider's perspective, what's the culture like working at Intuit? Um, I always um, feel very lucky when people ask me this this um, question and you touched on it when you described the company up front. So we are a real people led organization um, and a lot of companies, you know, sort of have the values on the wall and they say they're all about it. But um, this is a company where you actually can touch it and feel it. So from inside, we make all our decisions, including the work from home policy within COVID and the pandemic. It was led from people first, and that was the way that we that we made all of our decisions. And um, feel very fortunate to be in an organisation that does put the people really front and centre in everything that we do. Yeah, that's awesome. Dom, what does a work futurist do at Alassian? Um, I think I think my first answer is he looks like an inflated version of Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is different between him coming to Australia and me. I put on about twenty kilos. Um, uh, no, work futures, work futures is, a, is the best made up job in the world, right? Um, I, I'm very fortunate in that three years ago we were having a brainstorming session with a few people. Someone was like, "Hey, given that our mission at Atlassian is all about unleashing the potential of teams." We need to understand more about teams, where teams work, how they work, team cohesion, belonging, all the cultural aspects, the ways of working aspects. But we decided that we needed to know that better than our customers. And so we were like, cool, we need to understand the future of work. So we, we created it as a made up role for three months as an experiment. And three and a half years later, we're still running that experiment. Um, half my role is externally facing, helping our customers and companies of all shapes and sizes work out what does the future look like and how do they take those, those first few steps there. And then taking those lessons learned, bring them back into Atlassian and saying, a lot of people say that we're a tech company and it, and it kind of knocks me a little bit. We're just like Scott and, and Jen have both said, like we're a people company. Our biggest asset is our people. Our IP is our people. Our innovation is our people. We happen to use technology as a vehicle, but we, but we might not. 
uh, at some point in time. And so, you know, we, we have to take all those lessons learned from over 170,000 organizations globally that use our products and go, cool, what's next? Because, yeah, we just had an amazing year, an amazing quarter, and we can celebrate and we do celebrate our successes, but we can't let ourselves get complacent. We have to be dreaming and trying to live what that future might look like and making small changes every single day. So both externally and internally, that's something that I get to do and uh, evangelize. That's great. <laughs> Plus all the travel is also also a bonus for COVID, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about people and culture and this pandemic that's completely derailed all strategies that we had in, in January. Um, Scott, why don't we start with you in terms of from a macro level, what do you think the impact this pandemic has had within the Australian workforce? I think the, the biggest one, which is it seems a bit obvious to say, is just the migration of everyone having to work from home. So we literally got globally, not just in Australia, we got everyone working from home within 48 hours, including like over 9,000 of our external partners. So we were very fortunate, you know, we, we had a strong mission team that, that scrambled. Um, I think what it's shown us as a company and me specifically as a leader, it started to create the need to connect differently. So at a macro level, we connect, but we needed to, Zoom is the way of the world now, you know, even people like you hear, elderly relatives saying, what's this Zoom thing? You know, it, it's standard <laughs> lingo these days. But the, the bit that we, we started to, at a macro level, appreciate was a Zoom fatigue. You know, we're all sat at desks and the work, health and safety that that brings, you know, we were shipping chairs to people around the world from the office because so, we didn't want them to go into the office to make sure they'd got pre proper ergonomics at home. Um, and then I think the other thing that's a key factor that sometimes we take for granted is it brings an element of uncertainty for your people. So there's a bigger need around clarity on deliverables and an element of trust that we trust people to do that. So at a macro level, we've had to be really focused on one, the fatigue piece, but two, the clarity on the deliverables and how we empower people to do that when they're not in a physical bricks and mortar space. Yeah, definitely. Um, Don, what would you add to that? Yeah, cool. cool. I mean, I, I like everything Scott just said. It's it's funny. I mean, we we were extremely fortunate. We our third biggest office before COVID was home, and and so our work practices and and our technology was already there. Right, the, the, it was it was a very nonchalant flick of the switch for us. I mean, still a big flip because it was still a good 56% of the organisation that that had been used to being in an office that we we got to work from home. We gave everyone 500 uh, US dollars equivalent to set up their home office desks, chairs, monitors, whatever you need. Uh, and then start to alter our work practices. That's where our effort really went into to doing that. W one of the things I, I want to call out, because I, I think we're, we're quite fortunate with probably the attendees we've got. We're fortunate in Australia. We're fortunate with the panelists we've got. Like the, one of the things that I've seen, the, one of the biggest sales in software in the last three months has been surveillance software. And it always makes me chuckle because it's dead <laughs> easy for us to go, you should trust your people. If you hire smart people, we're a biggest selling software right now is surveillance software that takes a <laughs> screenshot of your screen every 10 minutes. And so I, I want to reflect on the fact that there's so many senior leaders I've got to work with in the last three years that have said, oh, our company can't do remote. We can't do work from home. If they were honest, they would have said won't because it, it wasn't, it wasn't, mm -hmm. a there was no blocker other than themselves, right? And, and now those same people are patting themselves on the back saying, oh, look, how, look at how well we've done. I'm like, mm -hmm. I want to call BS on that a little bit. I, I think you're surviving, <laughs> you're probably hating this lack of line of sight, which is odd. Because for knowledge workers, which account for about a billion people around the world, knowledge workers, there is no correlation between line of sight and their performance. Zero correlation, right? There isn't a production line. Nine to five, Monday to Friday needn't exist. But it's a construct that we've got stuck with. And I think we've got an opportunity here in all industries, in all sectors, to learn from the COVID experience. But I'm still concerned that some of our reactions are actually stuck in 1995. And we're not actually going to unleash our potential because we're not willing to embrace the fact that flexibility means uncertainty, right? And that when we challenge these constructs, we let go of that command and control that so many leaders have been used to. And I think if we can't change those nuanced things, which are very human things, if we can't change those, then we're not gonna build this new normal that we all want. Yeah, that's true. Um, Jen, you would have started at Zip just before COVID unleashed. So <laughs> maybe mid, talk mid COVID. No I was still okay. remote onboarding, my first remote onboarding experience. Um, so I didn't even let you finish your question then, Nadine. I'm sorry. I'm just butted <laughs> in, which I just do on, I mean, I do it in real life, but I do it on Zooms and webinars anyway. 
no, no need to um, confirm that, Tom. Thank you. Uh, yes, I did. I started. I started at Zip um, remotely, and it certainly was a new experience. The um, I guess something that made it a lot easier is I know my boss really well, and so we already had that site safety and trust to kind of challenge each other from the beginning. Um, but you just have to be a little bit more deliberate about everything. So I had to deliberately reach out to people. People were deliberately reaching out to me. Um, and I think that's like, even from a culture perspective, being deliberate about things isn't a bad thing. So I feel like I've done all right. I feel relatively well integrated. I'm in the office today because there are people that are back at the office and um, I've launched like full flexibility. Um, to your point, it was something that we, um, we, we kind of said that we did it in the past, but it was patchy in its adoption. Um, and when we looked at introducing it, the flip side was, it wasn't whether we're gonna offer it, it's do we trust our people? Yeah. And so flexibility is now um, something that we offer all our people. Now, I don't know if that answered your question because I didn't even let you finish your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You answered a question. You definitely answered yeah. a question. Yeah, I made my own question. So, this is great. <laughs> um, can I just add to that? Because I, I know you onboarded through COVID. I, I was in a fascinating discussion last week with someone, and, and I got the sense that they were they were metaphorically holding their breath, waiting for this to finish. And I said to them, "You need to stop holding your breath. Like it, it, it's sticking around." And I gave them the example of onboarding. Like we've we've onboarded over six hundred people in, in a COVID remote world. And it's funny because their question was, can you ever imagine a world where we onboard people? And I was like, I mean, I'm in it, I think. I would, we yeah. have. <laughs> and, and so I think there's there's almost this like reframe for a lot of us to go, whilst the whole COVID experiment is very upsetting and, and it's some people we don't like, we should maximize about five minutes in every hour whinging about it, which is hard coming from an Englishman who likes to whinge, but it's like carve out five minutes to whinge and then spend the other 55 doing something about it. Because it, it ain't going away. And so the quicker we embrace the reality that it's not going away, you get things like Jen pointed out, which is very deliberate conversation, very deliberate interaction, rather than, oh, this is really hard, so I'm not going to do anything. It's a very different mindset. Yeah, definitely. How, like, in terms of the, the impact that COVID's had, what do you guys sort of envision that your companies will adopt moving forward in terms of remote working? You know, Dom, I saw you posted yesterday, uh, uh, work from anywhere which I was like, oh, I like that. Like, that's really great. Um, but has there been lots of discussions around what that's gonna, and how that's gonna take shape at each of your companies? I mean, I, I, I don't mind going first. We're, we're being very purposeful on, on that one. Um, again, because we already had a lot of distributed work experience, we're in many offices like Jen and Scott, many offices around the world. So distributed skill set is not far off remote. Um, even if they're in a physical office, it's a very different office, different time zones. So therefore your working practices need to change. Um, and we've been very deliberate about saying, how can we learn from our existing remote experience? How can we learn from the COVID experience? And how do we build this in an inclusive fashion? Right? It's very easy to be knee-jerk, as some companies haven't gone, everyone works from home forever. And you're like, really? Does, does that work for everyone? Because that's not flexibility. That's telling me to work from home forever. Uh, similarly, I had a conversation last week with someone who said, when do you think you'll return to work? And I was like, I'm not sure if you realize I haven't stopped working. <laughs> like my place has changed, but, but I'm still actually working. And, and we've got this weird concept of like work equals place. And, and I think what this experiment has shown us is that we can be place agnostic. And so we're running a whole lot of experiments. I reckon half of them will work and half won't. And I don't know which ones will work and which ones won't. And as we evolve those experiments, the ones that work we'll do more of and the ones that don't we'll learn from. So I, I think it's one of those things work from anywhere for me is a concept I've been practicing for about three years. I've not had working hours. I've not had structure when you're traveling. I mean, I did 100 flights last year. When you're traveling that much, you're not doing nice five Monday to Friday. And so you're like, cool, what, what does on and off look like? How do I have the discipline to recharge mental health that, that Scott and Jen have both mentioned? Like, how do we carve out that time for purposeful conversations and, and care? But a lot of that discipline's on me. But I, I can't wait for a leader or a manager to say, Dom, you look like you're about to burn out. You should stop. I, I own that as much as they do. And making that a, a mature two-way conversation is, is probably the most important thing. What do, um, Scott, in terms of uh, how it looks at Intuit, because you guys have been working remotely since, was it early March? Yeah, we, we kicked off early March um, officially, but um, I know when I joined Intuit 18 months ago, I'd walk in, walk down corridors and you'd see all the video screens as much as I would imagine everyone else and like everyone would just be like, they'd be 
dogs walking behind people and you know I was like oh this is really flexible as a workforce and you know there was a bit of an in-joke as long as you got an injury t-shirt on you were fine it didn't matter where you were sat so very much to Don's point you can work anywhere um, and then I think from a personal perspective like managing multiple time zones you know like someone in my team is always awake and I don't want to be the person that has to always be awake at the same time you know I joke I'm only 23 I just look in my mid 40s but um, yeah, so it's just about the flexibility and we're having conversations at a corporate level now around do we need the bricks and mortar that we currently have um, we did a we did a survey a couple of weeks ago in the Bay Area for our San Diego office and our, and our San Francisco office and said who wants to come back to work in the first 15 percent and we got single digit responses to the survey you know never mind the take up of 10 percent to go back and mm -hmm. so as a leadership team we're looking at that and going this is fine, you know, like we've always done it. We didn't even overly formalize it. It was for you and your manager to have an arrangement that meant you delivered on your goals. So I think it's a long way of saying, I think it's fluid and we'll take a people first view on this as well. And we'll work with the teams to see what's right. Um, and the company will make the decision of what that needs to look like. How have you been, especially with everyone being remote, how have you been really building engagement or fostering that connection? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think to my earlier point around Zoom fatigue, we actually went into Slack fatigue as well. So, you know, the number of group Slack channels, me, me as well, you know, I had one, let's call it, we called it staying connected. Um, and in the early days, as the, the, the different countries and the different teams were starting to feel the, the, the difference, we wanted to stay connected and we wanted to make sure there were some common themes. So we were doing like daily yoga sessions or five minute stress busters where we would do like stretch exercises and things like that. And we did that at a global level, but also at a local level. Um, but you can see the take up and the, the sort of the dialogue on the Slack channels is really easing back. Um, and only this week I had a bit of a reality check. So I did, um, I was talking to the team in Paris and they were the first to go off. They were in February when they went home. Um, and I was like, this is the fourth time we've had a monthly review. And, you know, and I started to hear myself saying, thank you for keeping your momentum. Thank you for, you know, staying safe. And they were like, oh, I forgot it's different. You know, I can't remember when we used to do this in the office for you, Scott. You know, so the new norm is really starting to kick in. Um, so I think the staying connected focus was very upfront now and the teams are naturally finding the, the sort of the new middle ground of what's right. And I think, again, as leaders and organizations, we don't want to force that on people. We've got to be very careful and we've got to listen to our teams. Yeah, definitely. Jen, um, what have you guys been doing over at Zip to keep engagement? And I know people are starting to come back to the office, but especially in that remote aspect, we'd love to hear more. Oh, I don't even know really where to start. I think <laughs> one of the things that has been, um, it's been a great excuse just to reach out to people more um, from a people perspective. So we ran focus groups through Zoom and um, I, I actually quite, I quite, it's probably one of the best focus groups I've ever run for no other reason than it, everyone was on the same playing field. If you're introvert, extrovert, chat and speak up. Um, and people were super candid and honest because we actually genuinely cared. So I haven't gone through a pandemic before. I don't know how to manage it from a people perspective. Why don't we ask people what, what they want or what they need from us? And that was probably the most, it was awesome for me to meet people being pretty new, but it was probably one of the most valuable things um, that we did. And people were reaching out, thanking us for running focus groups. Like there was this weird moment where people were just thankful <laughs> to be to be heard and that was authentic and genuinely cared. Um, so, and I wouldn't say that's like an engagement tactic, but it was just something that was so surprising and worked really, really well. Um, on a more kind of superficial, probably not superficial, but it we have been running like regular weekly kind of challenges. Um, um, like there was a great one around like MTV Cribs, do like a video come in like pimp out your house like that kind of thing and like all the the lols associated with that like riddles cooking clubs all that all that good stuff um but probably the most meaningful one has just been around the work we've been doing with leaders on how to actually have proper coaching and like candid conversations with people lots of new first time leaders at dip and um, it's the best kind of um step up development opportunity but would have no idea how to have like a, a conversation normally, let alone during these kind of times. And so um, for us as a business, we took an experiment and said to our leaders, we trust you, we have you back. 
do what you need to do with your teams. If that means that someone needs to take a leave of absence because they're a new mom, kids aren't in daycare, kids are sick, all this kind of stuff, do it. Like you don't need to ask people team or someone's um, permission for it. And so probably that real kind of empowerment at that legal level was the most impactful um, thing I think we did from that perspective. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's an interesting point because we had a conversation earlier this week about all the articles that are out in terms of how great working from home is, how productive everyone is, but we're actually not really discussing <laughs> as Tom's putting it again to his head, we're really not discussing what are we sacrificing or struggling with, and especially as people, people, um, you know, it's uh, it's been hard. So Dom, why don't you kick this off? <laughs> uh, so I was just thinking about, as, as Jen was talking about those focus groups, I think it's important for us to always do the flip side. So you've got a great simple example there around listening to people and how powerful that is. Uh, a counter example, a company I was working with the other week, uh, they've done their pulse survey the feedback from their employees was that they were feeling overwhelmed with the amount of work and content and so they put together a two-hour webinar on dealing with being overwhelmed and i was like i don't think yes. any of you get the irony <laughs> like, what is the point attend this webinar and then you'll learn about man time management but, um so the the productivity thing it, it's it's like become a trigger word for me um, and that's because i think probably 95 percent of articles i read about i you know i work from home and i'm more productive First of all, they're not talking about productivity, they're just working longer, right? They're getting more tasks done, but they're not actually more productive. Uh, and, and second of all, no one's got an agreed measure of productivity that I've read that I like, right? It's, it's all like self-assessment. Do you feel more productive? You're like, yeah, cool, right? Everyone's more productive. You're like, well, what does it mean? Is there, is there more impact to the better outcomes, right? Is there more innovation? Um, also productivity is a measure of work. It's not any measure of my wellness, my health, my sustainability, like how a team actually works together and, and, and gets on. And so I think we've got overly fixated almost to the point of fetish on productivity. And actually we're missing the whole point of, of however long you work on a given day, I'm borrowing you from your life, right? I'm stealing you from your family, from your community, from, from society, from all the other high impact things you need to do. And so my job in borrowing you is to return you in a better state than I, I borrowed you in, right? And if we take that mindset and reframe it, then actually we treat people like people uh, which is not actually normal, I don't think. I think a lot of a lot of organisations and leaders talk about being people led, but when I look at their actual actions, I, I would call it something very different because they focus on efficiency, on productivity, on churning a little bit more out of you, and not on you as an actual human being and helping you grow and evolve and develop. And so we've we've doubled down on that. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done, we've we've got a, a leadership team meeting every Wednesday, first half hour. How are you? Doesn't have to be work related, certainly not project related. Like, how are you doing? What, what's going on in life? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, one of my colleagues in the US was talking about the angst of the you know campaigns and rights around Black Lives Matter. We talked about that for 10 minutes. Someone else talked about a personal issue they had or a family issue. Like, let's just share it because th all these things impact how we work. And then on the fun side, you know, we carved out as an exec team some time to do a painting class through the week. It was absolutely ridiculous. We were all useless at it. Um, highly competitive and absolutely awful in equal spades. But we got the easel, the paints. Um, we got the wine, you know, partners were invited, kids were invited, and for two hours we just chatted, painted, and laughed at each other because we were awful at it. But again, I think people over over index on like how do you build engagement and cohesion? You're like the same way you always did. Give a shit about the person, ask them how they are, listen, and then hang out with them. Like it's, it's the way you do it might need to change, but the actual ingredients are kind of the same. Yeah, it's so simple when you actually just boil it down to those three points. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and just Jen, to, guys, sorry, sorry, oh, go ahead, Scott. Sorry, sorry, Nadine. I was just going to say to Dom's point there, the bit that we tend to miss is the value of the water cooler or going and grabbing a coffee and walking or grabbing a sandwich together. And you can't recreate that with Zoom. So exactly to Dom's point, I think as leaders, we've got to make sure that we are factoring timing because you may not have a commute into the office now, but how many people are taking a full time, you know, a full one hour's worth of lunch? So um one of the things and it's a really easy thing is you know i've been really clear saying i've picked up running again since i've been in covid and if you catch me after lunch i'll probably still have my running top on you know and that's not shame you know yes you can see scott's a human being he's been for a run it's okay to turn up in your in your running gear the dog will walk past you know th there's no shame now you know even our our ceo in his first all hands when he addressed everyone 
he brought his family in because they'd come back from university to show that they were there and picked his dog up and said, this dog's going to bark now. You never used to hear that from me, but you're going to because this is my new life and I expect you to be real people. And it's just those small things to Dom's point. You know, you don't have to over index on it, but just be human. And I think it's it's a real important thing for leaders to show that and sort of walk the talk. Yeah, definitely, because it's you're you're literally inviting people into your home, <laughs> which is which is a like pretty literally. intimate experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We can all see Dom's um, wine rack. We've already come. Yeah. <laughs> <Totally. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, are there any other sort of overall, especially looking at at humans holistically, um, in terms of uh, initiatives that you guys have found that have been really really positive and well received? Um, whether it's on the mental health side of, side of things or the well like physical side of um, people's well-being. Yeah, if I, I'd like to share something that we've had really good feedback, and again, it's from the people perspective. Um, I think one of the realities that I hit quite quickly was you assume people are okay because they're at home and they're safe, but everyone has a different story. So, you know, when I started to do skip levels in the first couple of weeks, I've got people saying it's so hard. You know, even though my partner's home, we've got homeschooling children. And he needs to be on a Zoom call at the same time as me. Or, and then you've got the person that lives alone, you know, and they're like, I'm in lockdown. You know, I can't go, you know, particularly the teams in London, they were in physical lockdown and needed to be. So there's the whole demographic that you've got to play to. Um, so it sounds really easy, but we created a microsite around COVID and we broke it down into technology and your sort of setup. We then we had a section on physical well-being, um, we had one on mental well-being, and there was loads of things within all, within all of them. But the fourth one that I think I'm really proud of is we had a parent, parenting section in there. So we actually built courses from employees around how they were coping with homeschooling, um, you know, people that were still in school because their partner was a care worker, you know, like a key worker. And the, the feedback that we got from that was like, this is real, this is real people, you know. So sometimes we dismiss microsites and you know intranets because it's the way of the world but you can really use technology from the people perspective to help them through that because it does give them those physical tools and techniques to, to sort of get through it definitely Dom, was there anything specific at elastin that you guys have seen that's really taken off or surprised that you've seen it taken off from a well-being perspective yeah um, to, to, to kind of add add to scott's but there's there's a subtlety in there that, that i think some people may not have heard right um I think it's very easy to think, oh, COVID, work from home, people, HR problem, right? Someone someone in HR can fix that. Uh, every example Scott just gave isn't a HR fix, right? The, the democratization of solutions isn't new, but it's a concept that a lot of organizations aren't used to. And so I think for, for us, similar is, is the groundswell of people sharing laterally. Here's what worked for me. Here's a hack. Here's what I tried. Here's what didn't. That openness, um, we both shared that internally, and then we stuck it all on a microsite externally. We're like, hey. If it's good enough for us, it's good enough for everyone else. So, you know, at lastian.com slash remote, every free resource that we've ever landed on around making health teams work remote, we've stuck it on there. Because I think that there's a there's a, a challenge with a crisis where we all owe it to help each other, not just help ourselves. I've not seen that equally across organizations. A lot of organizations are holding their ideas as, as IP. We've taken the other approach of, and, and sharing them, but also having that mindset internally of saying, it's okay to not be all right. It's okay not to know, but let's share. Right, let's keep that sharing and keep that voice going. And I think that builds a lot of momentum, a lot of empathy. Um, and then the, the other thing we've had to do is to be really honest and call out the areas where we're making mistakes. They're very rarely, I don't think any of them are malicious. They're, they're, they're always good intent. One example was when COVID first hit, um, we just started doing lots of broadcast, lots of videos, lots of broadcasts, lots of telling stories, and we just stopped listening, right? And so we're like, hang on, we, we think we're communicating, but we're not, because it's all one direction. How do we make sure we're listening? Uh, the other one was was uh, we'd occasionally have what I call accidentally ironic conversations where like we care about our people, your mental health, is, these are all the things we care about. And they're like, but don't miss your key four goals. <laughs> and you're right, like, yeah. which, which one of those is true? And, and, and it's both. <laughs> that you're running a business, not a charity. But how do you make those messages authentic? Which is if something has to give, what, what gives? Because if, if, if we're just adding more stuff into the bucket, it eventually it overflows. And so... You know, helping our leaders, similar to, to Jen and, and Scott, in a democratized way. This isn't a HR thing. This is an organizational thing. How do we all lift our capability, but do it with a level of humility? And then just admit when we screw it up, right? And tell those stories with, again, a level of, of humor and honesty. Hmm. Yes, it, Dom, to your point there, 
and this, I, some people take this the wrong way, so I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, but I actually don't believe people teams should own culture. Like culture is something that is owned by the whole company. It's the whole company, the leaders. And so I've had it in the past. I've had people and culture in my title, but there's a, it, that, that yeah, it's, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's, you assume that the people team will sort that out, they'll own the culture. Well, yes, they're there to kind of be deliberate and build some of those rituals and hab habits and help you with that, but they don't own the culture, you do. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Third or second that or fourth that, whatever, <laughs> whatever we're at. Um, Jen, on that topic, so in terms of being able to measure engagement, and it is something that is tricky to measure, be like, yeah, I feel more productive or yeah, I'm, I'm more engaged. Do you guys have anything at Zip in terms of measuring engagement, well-being, or sort of the experience that your employees are having? Yeah, so there's kind of there's the way that we've been thinking about it in the past and then how we're, and I'd love everyone's feedback on this and how we're going to think about it or try and we're thinking about thinking about it in the future. And so in the past, um, we've used a tool called Tiny Pulse, which is anonymous kind of weekly pulses where you get kind of a gauge on a different question um, over a period of time. Anonymous feedback, you can put your name on it, a nice like kind of heartbeat across the company. Um, and Slido or any of those kind of um, upvoting things in all hands and things like that to kind of get in the moment feedback. Um, and that's great, but to an extent, we don't think that's necessarily giving us the insights that we need or actually moving the needle. Like it's great, your company's at 80 something percent engagement. Uh, like maybe what was the benchmark last year? 80 something percent. Well, that's great, but we're, like, we're not actually identifying ways that we can grow and improve and so, Something that we're thinking about in our group scorecard, instead of putting um, as for FY21, instead of having an engagement score or a completion rate of goals or something like that, from a people perspective, we actually want to have a metric in there around inclusion and belonging. Because underneath that are all the good things that then contribute to a high performing and engaged team. Um, like there's a, there's a manager component, there's an experience component, all these different components, but we actually want that to be our North Star. Now, getting really kind of clear on that and metric driven and the business is saying it's too ambitious, like we may not be able to hit it. I don't really care because at least we're actually going to move the metric um, and actually have a really big impact in that space. So kind of keen to hear everyone's thoughts around um, if you tried to put um, metrics on inclusion and belonging because um, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'd say met metrics sometimes, um, but philosophically, I think that the bit that you landed on there is we, we've had a philosophy for a while now. We're, we're pushing this is measuring that at a team level, not at an aggregate level. It's very easy at an mm. aggregate level to say we're diverse because we have X percent. Let's let's do gender mm. diversity, X percent male, and you're like, cool. If if all the uh, females are in marketing and HR, and all the guys are in you know whatever, <laughs> that's not diversity, right? You've not got the richness. Mm diversity the value is at a team level where you get the friction that creates the sparks and so we look at team effectiveness at a team level and we look at that from us team cohesion as Jen mentioned a sense of belonging um, how you identify with the purpose of the team how you would go into bat or battle for your other teammates and how you collectively achieve goals and, and how you lean into that and that's that's for us a way more sustainable long-term way of measuring effectiveness than the outputs and individual stuff so it's a balancing act. So yeah. it's a lot murky. Measuring at a team level is complex and hard, um, but we're committed to, to working it out. Love it. Great. Scott, do you have anything to add on that front? No, all good. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, that's all good. Um, curious, when it comes to looking at what you invest in your, your people when it comes to um, uh, well-being programs and initiatives, like, do you guys have any on the budgeting side of it, do you guys have a ballpark figure or percentage or like what are you guys putting into your employees when it comes to um, a little bit more of the hard figures? Do you guys have any, this might be a tricky one to answer too, but. Yeah, I, I'm happy to go. So um, it's a bit of a ballpark figure because it's like what's included and what's not included. So for example, um, we've just launched 10 additional um, COVID days that you can take to accommodate burnout or, you know, just to like be present with your family um, and that sort of stuff is not included. We also give five days a year for what we call We Care Give Back, which is time in the community. 
So that's not included, but we're in a ballpark figure of around $6,000 per um, employee in the Australian market. And that does cover stuff like um, private health care, um, an element of training, but we also have the ability of $1,000 a year for you to put claims in with receipts for things like massages or even if you're stressed out and you can't get your lawns mowed so you can be focused on work, you know, we'll pay for Jim's mowing to come in and do your lawns, that type of stuff. So there's lots of little ways around it, but it's a ballpark figure, um, excluding annual leave of around 6,000 in the Australian market. That's great. Ooh. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Well, switching gears a little bit, I'd love to talk about what the future of work looks like. <laughs> um, lucky, just, uh, lucky you've got the work futurist here. <laughs> I know. I was say, <laughs> guess who's kicking this one off? <laughs> <laughs> the, the future of work guy might retire and become an artist. By the way, that's a balloon. If anyone's that's a, I'm glad you clarified that, Dom. Yeah, <laughs> You're like, what is that? Oh, there's a jelly bean. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on the technology front, wondering, uh, like reflecting back over the last couple of months, has there been one piece of technology outside of like a video conferencing that's been a really big savior for you in terms of getting getting through and connecting with, with teams and your company at, at large? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a bit old school. So one piece of technology has been the car. So when restrictions aren't in place, I will drive and meet someone, we'll stroll and have coffee together and talk. Uh, it's revolutionary. You should try it one day. <laughs> But just doing that once or twice a week on, on complex issues where I just want to, like, I can drive and I can go and meet someone, right? We're, we're very fortunate in Australia, like, we can do that. And so I have been doing that. Um, the other old school device I've been using, you may recognize these, they're called uh, phones. Um, and oh, so I can, uh, yeah, it's weird. Um, Jen won't remember, she's too young. But, um, and so uh, what I've been doing, that's a compliment. That's a compliment. What I've been doing is I'm meeting a day to a phone call so that I don't get that Zoom fatigue. Um, just so I, I, I take one meeting a day, one hour, plug the headphones in, I'll walk and talk and, 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 and do that. Um, and, and I think the technology aspect's an interesting one because there's a flip to it as well that I, I think isn't getting talked about enough. Like automation, robotics, or, you know, disruptions to roles and jobs has been occurring at a relatively decent pace for a few years. I, I have a firm belief that, that the COVID experiment will pour accelerant on that. And so we're already seeing organizations accelerate where they are going to automation to replace human type roles all right, or roles that humans would have done. And so there's a, another technology aspect for us to keep in the back of our mind, which is how do we not compete with the technology, but find the uniquely human things that make us human and do more of those so that we can stay relevant and employed? Because en masse across every industry, we will see an acceler accelerant of robotics and automation in the next few years. And I think we should be more prepared for that than ever before. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I, I feel like I've been going on a technology busting mission as opposed to like adopting new technology. The more I can kind of like de-technology my life because it, it is all technology is almost cathartic. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's the opposite to your, but even around performance conversations, we use some terrible archaic HRIS that I won't mention in case someone works at Bear, not Flair, Flair's great product, not the other, not this other product. Um, there's the plug. Um, but instead of people actually focusing on inputting end of year performance, people used to just spend all this time and admin in a system, which kind of defeated the purpose. They weren't having those meaningful conversations. So for this end of year, very different time and period, we scrapped it. We said, don't put stuff in the tool focus on the conversation. Here's how to have a meaningful coaching conversation that both feeds back and feeds forward um, and focus on that, not on using a tool. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes. Probably not the most scalable thing for when you get to 500 plus people, um, but we've had really good feedback so far about people actually talking about the development, which is great. Yeah, and I think on a larger scale, but very similar, one of the things that we did was, although we're still using the system, we've limited the input. So it's gone down to four key areas for the year end review. Um, one of them is obviously forward looking. One of them is completely based on feedback from third parties. Um, and then the other is about achievement to goals. Um, but we've also streamlined it down to four performance ratings. So we've gone, you know, like we've still got obviously financials to hit, but we've been very clear and transparent to streamline the process to make it easier. And that was driven out a lot of feedback from employees that said, 
I'm in this time of uncertainty. I'm now working from home. How am I going to collaborate? How am I going to achieve all of my goals? And my year end review is approaching like, you know, like a speed train here. So we took that on board to streamline the process very much like you were saying, Jenna, we did do that globally. Um, we did scale it. So we didn't remove the whole system, but we have slimmed it down. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is a bit like you, Jen, you know, like there's this whole like, oh my God, we're on Slack, we're on Zoom, we're on whatever. Um, but the AI element of it, we're actually using to actually support our people. So we've actually homegrown in our customer success team in Australia. We've actually used the Slack bot to be able to feed content within each other now that they're particularly working from home. So it doesn't remove the need for learning and development roles, but what it does do, it sort of automates a lot of it now that we're spread out and we're not in one physical location. So I think there's that sweet spot to be found. And I think we're sort of, everyone's navigating through that because it's still early days. Yeah. And I read a tweet uh, the other day from Aaron Levy, CEO of Box, that said the vast majority of world's enterprise software was built for a di very different way of working. In a digital first workplace, all enterprise software will need to be simpler, collaborative, real time, secure by design, and deeply integrated across our apps, which kind of leads to everything that we're <laughs> talking about. But what are some of the big hurdles that you guys are looking to tackle within your, your organizations? Um, Dom, why don't you kick that off? I, I think it's, so I, I can't disagree with that statement. The thing is, I think they're all table stakes and they have been for years, right? And so yeah. I, I think what we can understand is, is, or should try and understand is what are the nuances? I, I think that the philosophy that we're trying to work on with our products, with our practice, with everything we do is, what's the 80% that's the same for so many people that you can kind of codify it? And what's the 20% that needs to be personalized? Because at, at scale, right, and, and Scott's mentioned this, Jenna, as you have, right, yeah, we're five and a bit thousand people. If I try and build a personalized way of working for every one of those 5,000 people, it'll never be done. Similarly, if I build one way of working for the 5,000, it will only ever work with the, 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 the very loud majority, right, the hippos in the room. We don't want that either. So the, the middle ground for us is what's the 80% that we can bake in because it's relatively well known. Right, how you learn, how you develop, you know, certain sort of rituals or habits. Like you call those out, lock and load them in. And then you're like, cool, what's the 20% that we want you to personalize? And then how do we empower people to do that? And it's the same on products, right? If you build a product for a very, very specific solution, by the time you've built it to work for that specific solution, you've alienated so many other people. Similarly, if you make it work for absolutely anyone, it's got it's so unopinionated, no one knows how to use it. So the 80-20 rule is actually coming back for us in terms of what's the stuff that we know to be true, let's lock that in and make it easy. And then where can we share guidance, right? Instead of policy, which policy and process is so 1980s, instead of that, how can we have guidelines and, and suggestions and playbooks and things that people can use, but we trust them to adapt it to the specific environment and scenario they're in. Um, and when you trust people to do that and empower them to do it, you'd be amazed what they can come up with. And that's democratized leadership, it's democratized products that delight people, and, and certainly in, you know, both for Scott and, and Jenna, for me, we're all in industries whereby the consumer has a choice, right? The switching costs are relatively low. So if you're not delighting them every day, they just walk. And so I think having that mindset is, is critical to not just surviving, but, but thriving as you continue to delight them in the future. Yeah. Jen, what are some of the, the big hurdles that you're tackling for the rest of the year? I think it definitely has to do with um, well, many, many hurdles. I have like <laughs> meters and meters of um, hurdling to get over, um, but certainly around the global design to deliver piece. So COVID is another element. I've never done an integration where you haven't actually been um, on the ground with the team, learning about them, working with them. It's my boss has been at Google for goodness knows how many years has never done an integration remote. And so we're going through this new experience too. And how do you build that trust remotely over something that is so deeply personal and human um, impacting their everyday lives um, is pretty crazy, but also really fun. Um, and I don't, I don't imagine that'll be the last one that we'll have to do in this remote um, environment. So that's a really big one. And for us, it's really about scale. So how do we build those small repeatable um, people kind of habits and rituals um, that'll help us scale, but not slow us down because that has been a big part of the magic of where we've kind of got to today. Scott, how about for you guys at Intuit? Um, I think it, it's plus one all, on all of the above. I think the only other thing that I would add without repeating is it's just around making sure that we continue to foster that creativity. So, you know, how do you do, and I've said this before on the call, like 
there's that there's still something to be said for collaboration you know you've heard both dom and i say how much time we spent on a plane last year you know business travel is going to be very different in 2021 or whenever we can get back in the air but there's still a lot to be said to being in the physical space so i think there's an importance on making sure we've got that clear true north goal of where we're all heading linking into what we've already spoken around trusting the trust in the efficiency and the productivity of the people and then how do we virtually collaborate to get there because we're not going to be in the same bricks and mortar and that's a challenge that I'm sort of facing into and thinking now through with the team and particularly when you add in the complexity um, of time zones and different geographies you know so it makes it harder but we're also slightly fortunate that we always work in that way anyway we never have everyone on a call you know and someone's always got to get up early or be on late so it's slightly frustrating but it's also set us up to be able to collaborate virtually uh, so it's put us slightly ahead of the curve on that but that's the big one for me yeah um and we've talked about sort of like some trends whether it's automation ai what are some other trends that we're seeing for the future jen why don't we start with you Oh, I thought you were going to go to the futurist for the oh, future trends. I'm, I'm mixing it up. Future. You know? <laughs> um, I don't know. It's really interesting. Someone was telling me the other day, instead of it being the new normal, it's the next normal. So it will just continue to be like there will always be um, something that is kind of changing. I, I think the relationship between the employee and the business um, has has got a lot closer and um, around job security is something that's never kind of been cool um, recently until now. And so I think there's a trend around like, we, well, we have this opportunity to kind of build this much more longer lasting um, relationship with people where in the past that may, like retention may not have been as big a focus um, in the tech space. Um, I don't know if that's a trend. Um, I don't know. What are you thinking, work futurist? My handball. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, 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 so I think the, 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 if you look at like superpowers that, that we'll be celebrating in a few years, one is the art of unlearning, the ability to take a historical piece of knowledge, ritual habit, dropping it and giving yourself the space to time the freedom to add in a new one. Um, we'll start measuring things like learning velocity, how quickly we can take an insight, uh, draw from it, change our behavior and, and adapt. Um, and we'll sign up for a constant evolution and, and the word transformation will be put to bed forever because there'll be no transformations because we won't be doing these giant, I got caught with my trousers down and I need to catch up because I've missed the market for two years. It's mm. if, you, if you're if you not evolving every month, every quarter and keeping your customers and your employees the center of everything that you do, you'll just end up being a museum. Mm. That's interesting. How are you guys tackling uh, like the different learning styles while being remote? Yeah, I mean, so, so you just have to cater to them, right? You have to realize some yeah. people want to consume content and respond instantly. Some people still want the virtual live event. Uh, some people are happy to read. Uh, we've got a whole lot of subscriptions that we share with people. I think Scott mentioned it's, it's about putting it all out there and just seeing how different people consume, right? Some are books, some are online, some are in books, like, like working out. Um, we, we give everyone a, a $3,000 a year budget to say, this is your chance to spend money to learn and grow. Not going to tell you how to use it. Like if, if you don't develop a growth plan and spend it, shame on you because you don't carry it forward to the next year. It's like we're going to give you the access yeah. to it, but you still need the mindset, the positive intent to go and use it. And if you just end up being too busy to use it, then again, shame on you because that's that's you that did that, not anyone else. Yeah. Um, and Scott, what about you in terms of uh, trends or future roles or anything like that? I think the only the bit that I would add is the difficulty around the human element. So if you look at the whole employee life cycle, you know, I'm a big believer in you sit down and you interview someone, you get a good reaction, you feel that rep the rapport in the room. You know, a lot of companies, I mean, and this isn't new, we've been doing video interviews for years or, you know, like uploading your own video as part of the application process. But I think, Jen, you touched on it a virtual onboarding experience, a virtual recruitment experience, a virtual development conversation, a virtual manager relationship. It's different, you know, and it's different from both the manager and the employee. And I think that's something that can very easily get hit, hidden behind technology or process changes. And I think as leaders, we've got to be very cognizant of that and keep the human element in, in there somehow. Um, and it is, to Dom's point, it's going to be a new behavior to learn or an old one to unlearn. You know, what's the value of intuition moving forward in, an, in, a, in a leadership role? I don't know the answer to that. It's difficult. Yeah. 
And Jen, I know that you guys are, are growing and hiring. So how do you think uh, this you know, has changed your approach to recruiting or your recruitment strategy moving forward? Yeah, there's certainly um, was like that non the the I don't know the, the non-human um, like face-to-face -face interactions that it almost means that your process has to be more rigorous to remove that bias out of it where you used to just rely on a feeling when you met someone or the way that they looked or the and then that's all unconscious bias we're all biased like let's be comfortable with that um for us it, it means the talent pool potentially can actually be that much bigger yes there's some travel restrictions at the moment which make it a little bit harder but at the same time um this whole concept of distributed teams or not necessarily needing to be in the office together means that the talent pool can just be that much bigger so still um big b focus on the candidate experience i think it's adding more empathy as well into there given that people are going through these crazy times and there will be a period of time where job security is a really big thing and candidates aren't interested in moving um just from a there's just too much uncertainty and um, so probably yeah just a touch more empathy bigger candidate pool um, and hopefully removing some of the bias out of it yeah definitely dom is there anything that you'd like to add on that front yeah, I, I think just the, the the reality that you know, like I saw the depressing news the other day that the uh, the oldest millennial is now thirty seven, right? And, and people still talk about millennials like this fictitious generation that might enter the workforce. The oldest one's thirty seven. I'm like, oh God, God, I'm getting old. Um, but when you look at it, like the digital natives and digital immigrants are still living side by side. That this this new normal, next normal, whatever it is that we're moving into, actually favours the digital natives. Right, and so the the the, the old-fashioned pyramids kind of turned upside down. You know, if you chat to someone who's graduating from university right now, 95% of courses have been online for years anyway. Like their face-to-face -face time was minimal, and so they're like, "Oh, this is easy, right?" It's it's I'll lump us all into the same category. People like us are like, "Well, you know, but I did that face-to-face -face thing, and it felt better." Like the unlearning is for us, and, and actually, the more experience you get, the harder it is to unlearn. Right? Science has proven it, and so it takes concerted effort. And energy and time to actually unlearn those old habits because they work for us. And so I think the more we can do that and do that in an authentic and empathetic fashion and share with each other, the, the better we'll all get. It's, it's not going to be easy or quick. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, cool. All right. Well, we're getting close to time. So I'd love to give you each an opportunity to part on any advice or takeaways that you'd like to leave with the audience. So Scott, why don't we start with you? Um, if there's any anything specific that you'd really like to highlight. Um, yeah, thank you. I think the bit for me is around uh, just making sure as we focus on like the new norm is like it's not a process. We're not looking for process. You've still got to maintain your authenticity. If you want to be a great leader or you want to be a great organization to work for, you want leaders and that support processes and walk the talk. Um, and please, please remember that one size does not fit all. You know, like I said, you've got work from home parents, you've got people living from home, you've got all sorts of demographic out there. So the process isn't a process, it's about pe it's people. It's about making it better for people. Yeah, yeah. Jen, how about you? Uh, I think mine is the two ears and one mouth. So you should be listening, listening twice as much as you're talking and being more deliberate about it, reaching out and really kind of listening to what your people have to say, because often they have the answer. And then that could be a great experiment. This is the best time to be experimenting and trying something different. And um, so change the game. Yeah, definitely. Dom, how about you? Um, I, I read a scary stat last year that the, uh, the, the average person uh, is role modeled by 40 other people on a daily basis. So what that means is that the 185 people left on this call are all role models. Uh, it's just that no one tells you when they're role modeling your behavior. And so <laughs> it, it, once you realize that, that, that you're a role model to so many people, they just don't tell you, they're just gonna follow you anyway. It gives us this sense of urgency to say, be very purposeful, which both Jen and, and Scott just mentioned, purposeful in the actions, purposeful in how you listen, how you turn up, how you collaborate, because the way you turn up, 40 people are gonna follow and mimic that. And so if you want to see change, instead of waiting for someone else to do it and, you know, oh, we, we need a new way of working, so I need to wait for HR or someone else, just do it yourself. Get on with it. And other, like, 40 people will follow. 40 people will follow them. And before you know it, you've got a change program that doesn't need a name. Like, you just built momentum by driving change. So I uh, just encourage everyone, you know, who, who's on this to realize they are a role model to many people around them. 
And as soon as you realize that, more good can come from it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to buy some time for the audience to uh, get any questions in. We don't have any right now, but in the meantime, I'm going to walk through uh, an offer that we have. So return to work offer that's available for you. Yes, this is a shameless plug. Um, with a return to work offer, you actually get Flair for free, free onboarding, benefits, implementation, and training. There's no hidden costs or fees. Uh, we've implemented over 50 customers on this, and we're currently in talks with about 60 more. And you get to work with the wonderful team that's pictured there. So they are the dream team. They're lovely humans, and uh, they all have backgrounds in HR and recruiting. So there's going to be a link if you guys are interested in that now. And let's pop over and see if there are any questions. You guys might be off the hook right now. Is there any questions that you guys have for each other? <laughs> I feel like I've already asked all my questions at the panel. Yep. I'm all good, thank you. Cool, okay. Well, thank you, it's a wrap. Big thanks to you all. Like, the conversation's great, your insights were awesome, um, and it's been a really good discussion. Uh, thanks for everyone who joined. We're having people drop off now, and big thanks to the team behind the scenes, both Brittany and Queenie. Um, it was been, they put a ton of work into this and it's been seamless. So thanks for everyone for joining and uh, for joining the Create an Engaged Workplace and have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. <laughs>